Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Tori Allen, President and CEO of Arts Midwest. I'll be moderating today's webinar. Before we get started though, I'd like to share a few bits of information. Closed captioning is available for this webinar. To turn it on, just press the closed captioning button in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded. An archived version will be available on Arts Midwest YouTube channel by the end of the week. Following the webinar, all attendees will be emailed a resource guide with links to articles developed by CLA and NEVA. We'll also keep you in the loop as we gather additional information in the future. In just a moment, I'll turn it over to our speakers who will present for about 25 minutes, and then we'll use the remaining time for question and answers. We've prepared some questions from our survey submitted in advance. If you have additional questions, feel free to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Today, we're joined by the following experts. First up, we'll hear from Karen Grease, principal at CLA. Karen provides tax compliance and consulting services to exempt organizations and has been active in assisting organizations with the navigation of various COVID economic relief opportunities. Then we'll hear from Larry Adams, principal at CLA. Larry has 30 years of experience working with and managing audits of nonprofit entities, focusing on institutions of higher education, as well as arts and cultural organizations. And finally, we'll, we'll hear the latest on the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant from Jim Brunberg, co-chair of the National Independent Venue Association's Implementation Task Force. Jim is a composer and musician who owns venues in Portland, Oregon specifically Mississippi Studios and Revolution Hall. All right, that's it for me. Take it away, Karen. Thank you, thank you so much, Tori. And thank you for everyone for joining us through the presentation. You know, today we're gonna to talk about a variety of items as it relates to opportunities through COVID relief that's available to arts and culture organizations. We're gonna talk about the highlights of the Consolidated Appropriations Act, talk about PPP, you know, start out talking about the Paycheck Protection Program that I'm certain most of you or many of you have already participated in. Larry Adams is gonna take us down speaking about employee retention credits. I think many lost opportunities that we need to make certain that we're focusing on. And then Jim's gonna round it out with the SBO grant opportunities. I think an area that we're really anxiously awaiting information for our arts and cultures organizations or venues that could potentially um, participate or take advantage of this area. With the Consolidated Appropriations Act, just real high level, signed into law December 27th. You can read the information on the slide, so I'm not going to go through that. But I think what's really key is that there are additional opportunities for us as we look at the PPP program, you know, new eligible borrowers, there's increased expenses that are allowed, but most importantly, more flexibility and clarification through the forgiveness process. So I'm going to talk about that as we go through the presentation. We talk about employee retention credits and throughout the presentations and the resources that the team at Arts Miss West is going to send out after we are done, there are going to be links and other opportunities for you to go out and visit more information to really see how these programs may be impactful for your organization. So dive right into PPP updates. Again, what we're looking at at this juncture are really two programs being available. One, which is still the PPP one, which is the program that's available for first time borrowers under the Paycheck Protection Program. And then PPP2, which if you had a loan, the first time through, and you meet, have spent all of the funds that you obtained through that first draw loan, you have the ability to go in and request a second draw on that loan. There are some eligibility changes when we look at the program itself and expanded types of organizations that are eligible. And as I said, most importantly is the fact that we have additional eligible expenses that can be part of our forgiveness. So taking a look at that 60% bucket versus the 40% bucket, there's more expenses that are eligible in that 40% non-payroll type expenses, operator expenses, supplier costs, et cetera. So it really creates more flexibility and more opportunities for organizations to achieve a full forgiveness of your PPP loan. 
For those of you that are going in for your second draw loan under the PPP program, you know, many arts and cultures organizations really relied upon that critical funding the first time through. And this is just as critical knowing where we are. We're really looking at a 300 employee maximum. You cannot have more than 300 employees to be eligible for the PPP second draw loan. You calculate that 300 maximum based on the prior 12 month headcount. And you include not only your organization, but if you have affili affiliated organizations, they are included. It must also be noted that you must have used all of your PPP funds from the first loan. Forgiveness isn't required. It's just you must have spent all of the costs or all of the amounts on eligible costs. And in addition, there's a requirement that there be a 25% reduction in gross receipts. Now that gross receipts reduction, what's key and I think confusing for many organizations, it's not a calendar year reduction. You have to have a reduction in one quarter of 2020 compared to the pre-COVID quarter of 2019. You achieve that reduction, then you are eligible for a PPP second draw. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the sizing. You can read the slides. You know, the sizing itself is very similar to what we had in the past. You calculate your average monthly payroll times two and a half, 2.5, and it really gives you your maximum loan size. The expenses that qualify as payroll related expenses are still the same salaries, health benefits, retirement, et cetera. But one item that is different with the PPP two is you had a maximum loan on the first draw of $10 million. Under PPP two, the maximum loan is $2 million. Where we're at in the PPP process right now is the fact that the program has not been fully extinguished. There's still dollars out there. So if you are looking at going down the path of securing a PPP two loan, there is still time. The time though ends the earlier of the extinguishment of the funds, whereas all the funds are loaned out to eligible organizations, for profits and nonprofits, or when March 31st. So keeping your eye or pulse on the program, knowing whether or not there's still funds available is really key, but it's not a race to the finish line, similar to what we had the first time when the program opened up in April of 2020. The loan application process itself, I'll just spend a couple minutes. Organizations are finding it most advantageous to consider using your same lender that you use for your first PPP loan. And it's more from an administrative ease pr process. Your lender knows you, they understand your organization, you already have a relationship. However, I've had a number of organizations as I work with organizations all throughout the nation on PPP that have said, their lender was perhaps not the most um, customer service friendly organization, and they are going out and looking for a different vendor to serve in that relationship. Perfectly fine. It's just your first recommendation would be looking to your current bank. The other item is that the SBA application remains the same. There's only one application that's submitted to the SBA, but the format that your bank uses, the portal and the processes might vary. So be aware of what those requirements are before you go in and including just similar to what you did for your PPP one loan, that you have all of your supporting documentation to really support the level of the loan that you're looking to acquire. That is what's key is being prepared as you go in with your PPP loan. I like to think we've been through it once, we can do it again, but it is a matter of just having all of the critical information. Some other considerations is that if you are an organization that didn't go in the first time or funds ran out, if you have already applied for PPP-1 and you went in and did that maybe in January, you didn't get it during 2020, but you secured a loan in January of 2021, you may also be eligible for a PPP-2 loan as long as you can meet the criteria that you have used all the funds before that March 31st date. So if you are an organization that just just went in now in January or last month, keep in mind that you do have the ability to potentially go in for PPP2 before the program actually closes. One another change that happened with the forgiveness process, and I like to, in essence, highlight this. When the program first came out in 2020, it was an eight-week period that we had to spend all our funds. Then it became anywhere between eight and 24 weeks. We felt we had to use a 24 week period. 
with the, cons the Consolidated Appropriations Act, what actually occurred is now you can use any period for forgiveness up to 24 weeks. So you can't exceed the 24 weeks. So as you need to pull in additional eligible expenses to leave payroll on the table, to be eligible for the employee retention credits that Larry's gonna talk about, you have that flexibility. Even if you reduce your FTEs, it doesn't mean you'll have to repay any of your loan. It just means it may take longer as you go through the forgiveness process. You have up to 10 months after the end of your covered period. You know, the end of your covered period is any time between eight and 24 weeks, whatever you choose. And you have up to 10 months after that to go into for forgiveness. So there's much time, but if your covered period ended maybe in June of 2020, you're bumping up against that 10 month period. So focusing on the forgiveness now is really key. And the fact that the SBA reissued or updated or have new forgiveness applications that came out during 2021 in January, there is the short form that if your loan was $150,000 or less, there's really a short form forgiveness application that you're basically certifying that all of the expenses were used for the appropriate purpose and that you have should say retain the appropriate documentation. You don't have to send that document in documentation into the SBA, but what we're hearing is many banks still want to see your documentation to really ascertain that forgiveness was achieved. So accumulate that information, take it into your bank, be prepared. But again, my takeaway is the fact that the forgiveness applications have changed. So as you're going and working with your lender, please be aware of that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Larry Adams, That is, and he's going to speak about employee retention credits. Thanks, Karen. Um, you can go to the next slide. As Karen mentioned, you know, the employee retention credit is a little bit under the radar. And when the CARES Act was passed in March of 2020, uh, you were not allowed to get the employee retention credit and the PPP loan. And obviously, the PPP loan was a, a, a big talked about thing. And so most people went that route. Um, what happened with the, um, the, the Consolidated Appropriations Act that was passed December 27th is it allowed for uh, 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 retroactive claiming of the employee retention credit, even if you got a PPP loan. So what I want to do today is just spend a couple minutes refreshing you on what the employee retention credit is, what the benefits are, and, and how you can manage that process along with your PPP loan forgiveness process. So as you can see on this slide, you know, the big thing on the first bullet is that it's 50% reduction in gross receipts for a calendar quarter or a full or partial government shutdown. So if you don't have the 50% gross receipts test, you would use the full or partial government shutdown. Now it needs to be an actual order by a governor or some state official, but as you probably know, there's a lot of that going on and there's a lot of people who qualify just under the government shutdown. Now, if you use the gross receipts test to qualify for this credit, you get to use it for the entire quarter until your gross receipts you know, go back to 80% decline or 20% decline. Uh, if you use the government shutdown provision, then you get to use this uh, period only during the period of the government shutdown. So what is the credit? For the year of 2020, the credit is a maximum of $5,000 per employee. So it's wages and benefits, 50% credit resulting in the $5,000 credit. For 2020, there's also a, a, a bifurcation with the number of employees you have. So if you have gr greater than 100 employees, then you had to be paying your employees to not work. Okay, so you, you couldn't find a place for them to work, they couldn't work remotely, but you still continue to pay them, those, those individuals qualify for the credit. If you're 100 or less employees, any wages and health benefits paid in 2020 would qualify towards that $10,000 limitation. The other thing you might ask is, you know, I'm a nonprofit, I don't pay taxes, how is the credit going to benefit me? And the, it will actually have an immediate benefit for you because you file uh, the credit on your 941, which if you don't know, is your quarterly payroll tax return. So at the end of every quarter, you submit all your federal withholding and taxes and reconcile it with your payroll tax reports. Well, 
when you uh, apply for the employee retention credit, you simply file an amended 941, include the, the credit as you've calculated it, and, um, and then you get the credit immediately. So you get the benefit immediately. And the way we see this working forward, uh, when we get to 2021, it will be including it on the, on, the current, um, on the current filing. So the last point there, and it's an important one, is if you have a PPP loan and you're gonna apply for the employee retention credit, you cannot use the same qualified wages or benefits to apply for both. So to the extent you had a, a 24 week covered period in 2020, what we're finding is there's still plenty of wages and benefits that weren't in that covered period that will allow you to apply for this um, $5,000 credit per employee. And if you turn the slide, Karen, the, the news even gets better because in 2021, this Consolidated Appropriations Act increased, remember I talked about that bifurcation of number of employees to the type of credit you get? Well, now the, the limitation is 500 employees, any wages and health and, and benefits qualify. So in 2021, many more organizations will qualify. And then you also you can get the PPP loan and the employee retention credit. Um, again, the, the gross receipts test was, was loosened so that rather than having a 50% a gross receipts test in 2020, there's a 20% reduction that's required in a 2021 20, uh, versus 2019 quarter, um, or you still have that partial or full government shutdown. So if you're an organization that has basically been shut down and unable to operate the same way that you operated in February 2020, from March of 2020 through today, you're still eligible for this credit. And if you're eligible in 2021, the credit is much more generous. So as I mentioned before, it was $10,000 for the year of 2020 and a $5,000 credit. Well, in 2021, it's $10,000 per quarter and a 70% credit. So you can earn up to a $7,000 credit per quarter for quarter one and quarter two, provided you meet the gross receipts test or you are subject to the full or partial government shutdown. So, you know, kind of putting it all together, if you were shut down, and let's say you're going to be shut down through June, the maximum credit per employee is fourteen th or $19,000, $5,000 for 2020, $14,000 for 2021. So, you know, significant credits. Um, there's calculations that you have to do. Again, this is a little bit different because the employee retention credit is something that it's handled on an IRS form. So there's no SBA approval necessary. Um, obviously, like any IRS form, it's subject to audit by the IRS, but you, know, you do the calculations, you come up with the number, you either file the amended return or you have your payroll provider help you with it. But in 2021, we see that you know this can happen on an ongoing basis and there's no, gonna be no need for an amended 941. So uh, employee retention credit, you, you need to manage it with the PPP loan forgiveness, but please don't forget about this benefit because it can be lucrative if you qualify. Um, and with that, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Jim and we're gonna talk about uh, the Shuttered Venue Operator Grant. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Sorry about that. <laughs> I did the classic not mute. We're having a blizzard here. So if my Wi Fi goes out, I've got a backup plan to use my hotspot. So if I disappear, uh, just give me a minute and I'll be back because my Wi Fi is a little spotty. So thank you so much for putting this together. And thank you, Larry, uh, for reminding people about the, uh, the, re the employer retention credit, which is meaningful. Um, and something that everybody should keep in mind. It's sort of the unsung uh, minor hero of, of the federal efforts to bring some relief, especially to those of you who have managed to hold on to some of your staff. Um, uh, so the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant stems from something called the SOS Act, Save Our Stages Act, that was put together by a combination of for-profit and non-profit venues. Um, and it's a very narrowly tailored program uh, a lot of entities have reached out asking, uh, is this something that we'll qualify for? And uh, I can't tell anybody individually whether they'll qualify or not. Um, it's certainly not up to us, it's up to the SBA and we don't have all the rules yet. But what I can do here is do a quick download for you of everything that we do know about the program. Um, like I said, it's narrowly tailored. 
Um, it's going to be uh, it's going to be really specifically uh, aimed at entities who have been completely shut down by this, and who um, provide performance arts performances uh, in a in a public setting. So uh, I've been asked many times by um, entities like schools. Uh, you know, we're a school, and my daughter takes uh, takes lessons at a school. Um, if if your entity is something like that, and, and the school has been able to pivot and go on and mitigate the damages coming from the pandemic, it's it's actually fairly unlikely that you'll qualify for some of the things. And you'll see why here as I as I walk through it. So it's going to be run. This program is going to be run by the Office of Disaster Assistance. They're the same entity that did the EIDLs. Um, it won't be run for banks um, it, unless there's a crazy pivot that, that we're not we, that we haven't foreseen. This is going to be run directly through the SBA uh, Office of Disaster Assistance. Uh, it's very likely to go through grants.gov. A lot of people have asked whether this is going to go through something like the NEA. That's very unlikely. Uh, and I just want to clarify, because we get a lot of questions, it's not being run by NEVA. Uh, there's been a lot of press through NEVA, especially for the SOS Act, in the advocacy portion of this, uh, as we pushed to get people to write letters to their Congress people uh, to support the SOS Act. So a lot of people who uh, so maybe don't pay as close of attention think that this is being run by NEVA. We get a lot of emails uh, asking us if, uh, you know, am I eligible? How do, where, how do I... How do I apply for my grant through you guys? Not through NEVA at all. Um, and then also, I'm, I'm gonna say this probably three times, but you cannot receive an SVO if you're applying for the PPP. The SVO is a separate and they are mutually exclusive. You can't receive a PPP if you're applying for an SVO and vice versa. Um, and that's been made clear in, in the FAQs that the SBA has, has put out. It used to be that people were like, well, I'll, I'll apply for one and I'll, I'll see which one I get and then I'll weigh the two. No, the SBA is forbidding that. That's an important thing I want to remind you of. So you have to make a choice. Uh, and for a lot of entities, um, it, 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 if you don't know if you if you qualify after this my little presentation and after reading up on the SVO uh, grant program, if you don't if you don't know, it might be safer to apply for that PPP. But we'll give you some resources to help you figure out. Next slide, please. Um, so this is for live performance uh, venue operators and promoters, uh, both nonprofit and for-profit. That includes theatrical, it includes uh, people who put on events uh, in venues, and it also includes brick and mortar events uh, or event spaces. Um, it, it, they, we've been told by the SBA that it's very unlikely to include things like wedding venues uh, or sporting venues and things like that. That's all been uh, said by in the FAQs that came out, the second round of FAQs that came out last week by the SBA. Uh, it's open to people who are theatrical producers, talent representatives. Uh, if you are a talent representative, you should ask questions through an organization called NITO, N-I-T-O, um, because they know a lot more about how this program applies to venue or to uh, talent representatives. I know, uh, I'm an expert on how this applies to venues and promoters. Uh, as much as a person can be an expert, uh, seeing as we don't have any exact rules yet from the SBA. Uh, it implies also to, to independent movie theaters. Um, and again, that they have an organization that I can refer you to. If you're an independent nonprofit uh, or for-profit independent movie theater, um, some of the information I'm going to be putting out there today may not apply to you. It's very industry subsector specific, and the SBA is doing a really good job of putting together an application process that makes sure that the money goes to those who need it most in very specific uh, subsectors of each industry. Uh, and then certain nonprofit museums are eligible as well. And again, that is not my area of expertise. I'm going to focus on live performance venue operators, performing arts organizations, uh, theatrical producers. Uh, if you're a movie theater or a museum or a talent representative, uh, I can give you organizations to and refer you to there. You have to have been fully operational um, just before the pandemic hit. Uh, if you were in construction or you weren't there yet, then you don't qualify. And much like PPP, you have to demonstrate at least a 25% gross earned revenue loss in any quarter. That's really an easy bar to hit. I'm sure that you're all experiencing that. Um, but there are other bars that I will get to that are much more steep, uh, that are higher hurdles for entry into this program. Um, and another thing, you need to have not thrown in the towel. This last bullet point here is an important one. If you've declared bankruptcy or you've closed your operations and, and uh, gotten out of your lease and you're calling it quits, you can't make up for money that you lost in 2020 
uh, compared to your 2019 revenue because you are no longer going to be in, the, the federal government seems to be wanting to invest in the future here not re reimburse us for our losses so much um, this is not available uh, if you are uh, publicly traded it's not available if you are if you get more than 10 percent of your gross revenue from the federal government um, and then there's sort of a three strikes and you're out uh, rule here that is if if you are any more, if you're more than two of these things, that's if you operate in more than one country or in more than 10 states, or if you have more than 500 FTEs, uh, you are out. But you can have any one or even any two of those things and uh, still qualify for this thing. Um, and then the, it's because this is the federal government, can't be a strip club or present prurient or sexually focused entities. Next slide, please. Um, so here are some of the specific things that were written into the act that Congress uh, felt were important. Uh, to qualify entities for, for these things. Uh, a defined performance and audience space. So if you're a festival, for example, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about some of the gray areas, but I can't cover every bit of gray area, uh, but defined performance and audience space, we don't know yet what evidence they're going to require, but they have said in the FAQs that a floor plan is an example of the type of evidence that the SBA will be asking for. Um, so if you are sort of a, um, a, a roving entity that, that, that just sort of sets up a tent and does pop-ups, the SBA has already told us that it's unlikely that you'll qualify. However, if you're a festival, you may qualify if you're a regular promoter and you regularly promote events. Um, you need to have paid people who are uh, either employees or contracted laborers who who fulfill one of these or two of these roles and then they list five or six roles, sound engineers, booking agents or talent buyers, uh, stage managers, security personnel and box office manager. These are sort of indicators that you are an events organization that puts on live ticketed events that people can buy tickets for and that, that are open to the public. That's an important uh, bar. If, it's, if you're entirely volunteer run, uh, it seems that Congress uh, is not aiming this program at you. If you're a volunteer organization that doesn't have any paid employees, uh, you don't pay your performers, that's, uh, those are uh, points against you for the SVO grant. It seems that Congress wants to pr protect jobs here and economy. Um, okay, so another thing you have to do is uh, you have to impose a, a ticket or a cover charge. And we don't know exactly what evidence that's going to be, if it has to be advanced sales, and if we're going to be asked to provide ticket manifests through our ticketing uh, company platforms, or if there'll be some other evidence that they will accept, we don't know yet. But that's what it says on the, in the law is that you have to charge. These can't just be free events uh, that go out there that you go out and do with, again, as I said, volunteer uh, labor. And then uh, say I already covered the next bullet point. And then uh, performances are marketed through print or online media. Again, it's very likely that they'll ask for evidence of this. That means that these are things that are contributing to a culture and community uh, and local economy and commerce uh, in that they are open to the public. These can't be just private parties. If you're a private party host as a, a purely wedding venue and private party, they've given us strong hints that that will not be allowed. Uh, you're probably better off in the PPP if that's you. Next, next slide, please. This slide, I, I have limited time. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but read the act summary. This is another way that the SBA has defined broad, broadly defined eligibility. Um, one, the, the first number one way to be eligible here is what we call the 70% rule. If your business isn't really about presenting live performances of one kind or another, you probably won't fit into the SVO grant. And so the first way of putting it here is called the eligibility path number one. Um, and it mostly has to do with that. And, and, and we don't know again, what evidence will be required to show that 70% of the entities earned revenue derives from cover charges or ticketed sales. Uh, and the other things that come along with that, like concessions around specifically relating to those events. We're not sure about what evidence is going to be required but they're taking good time to come up with good rules. Uh, we can only trust that these rules will make sense and that the rules of evidence that they're coming up with will serve um, you as a performing hall and, and keep some of the uh, potentials for abuse uh, from coming in and taking and draining these funds. This is really about preserving culture and community and jobs 
uh, and performance events as, uh, as an industry. Uh, and the second way that you can come in, and this is uh, some nonprofits fit better into this eligibility path. Um, these aren't sort of exclusionary uh, eligibility rules. Um, I won't go any more specific than this. These are just two different ways of sort of looking at the eligibility. Um, this one's not the 70%, but rather you make tickets available uh, two months ahead of time uh, that the public can purchase and you contract to pay, again, you pay performers uh, fairly and you have, can show some sort of evidence of that. It may be contracts, uh, it may be 1099s. We're not sure about the evidence yet. Next slide, please. I know there's a lot of words on that last slide. I'm not gonna focus on it because it's a real time suck and I don't have much time. Um, what's the amount of this grant? The amount of this grant is 45% of your gross earned revenue from, from 2019. 2019, they're assuming was a good year, a normal year. And uh, across the board on average, it, it was. For all of our uh, organizations, we've sort of done some, some studies and 2019 looked like, looks like a good year to look at uh, for, for an average year for, for events, income, for, for performance spaces. So they're looking at 2019. And if you pass through all of these eligibility requirements, uh, you can get a grant for 45% of that. It's a big grant. Uh, but again, this is a narrowly tailored program and we're still not sure about the evidence. So I would caution you um, about really reading all of the rules, read a good summary of the act. There's one on the NEVA site um, where you can read the act itself and spend a little time understanding these things and trying to say, well, if I were in the SBA, what sort of evidence would I wanna see? And ask yourself if you have that evidence that can show this. Uh, and then if there's still money in the fund, there'll be a supplemental period um, after I think it begins in, in April. We, we won't spend time on that but because we're not there yet. Uh, next slide, please. There's also language in there. If you're a new entity and you, were, you weren't open for the entire year of 2019, there are some rules that apply to you. But again, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. I'm not going to spend any time on that because it's right now. I just I, I want to make sure I get through all the important points. When is this going to happen? There's all sorts of speculation. There are rumors. Uh, I just want to tell everybody, and this is kind of what I do every day now, we're doing outreach to find venues that might not have known about the program. Uh, we're looking at uh, little jazz clubs that might not be on the national circuit, but still make their living entirely through performance events. We are doing outreach. Uh, and the number one question we hear is, when is this going to happen? And we just don't know. It could happen next week, or it could happen April 1st. Somewhere in that window, we've heard rumors all over the place. Um, and I, I'm not going to speculate. Um, the supplemental grants we know won't start until after April. Now there are things called priority periods associated with this, with these grants and the priority periods are important. Um, one of the reasons that the priority periods are important is because there is a perception, um, whether it's valid or not, that there might not be enough money in this grant program to cover everybody. We don't know. We don't exactly know. There's a lot of interest in this grant program, but we don't know if there's enough money or not. We hope that there is, and we've already been given the nod that there may be replenishment uh, in the next round of relief. Um, it's already written in, in by committee that there's a, there's a number that's been put into the next round of uh, the big Biden package that will replenish this if there's not enough. The other reason the priority periods are important is because there are many entities, both for-profit and non-profit, that are literally on fumes. They've had zero dollars uh, for, I, I have a little calendar on the wall. It, it, it's been 337 days without income for entities in Oregon, for example. We closed down uh, on March 12th. So 337 days ago, we earned our last dollar. Uh, and there are some entities who have no other stream of income other than earned income. And that includes a lot of nonprofits. There are a lot of nonprofit uh, performance venues who don't have a large donation income and they don't have a whole lot of contributed income of any kind other than maybe a few sponsorships here and there. Uh, there are nonprofit performance venues um, that specialize just in putting on shows. And the reason that they're a nonprofit is so that they can help, it helps them put on shows without having to constantly look at the bottom line of things like alcohol sales and some of the things that for-profit venues um, are, suffer from. So don't think that, this, that these priority periods are just for for-profits. If you're a nonprofit, look at your books. You might fit in. The first one is for the first 14 days. Lots of words on this slide, but I'll sum it up. There are two periods and they're each two weeks long. The first money is gonna go out to these, these entities that are literally on fumes that have had zero income, or I'm sorry, 10% of their normal income. If you're down to 10% of your normal income, you qualify in the first two weeks. 
if you're at 30% of your normal income, you're going to qualify in the two weeks after that. And again, it's really important to note here that we're looking at gross revenue, not just earned income. Um, if it were just earned income, everybody would qualify for the priority periods. Um, this is, these priority periods are put in here to get help first to those who need it most. And those who need it most are those entities who, with their gross, everything that's coming in, they're still down at 10% of their normal income or 30% of the normal income. So there's been some discussion about why the bill has the words gross revenue for the priority period eligibility, but then earned revenue for the amount of the grant. That was intentional. The reason that this is that way is again, to help those entities, both for-profit and nonprofit who are literally running on fumes and have zero other income uh, or very low, very low income. Um, there's also just to, to set your minds at ease. If you're saying, well, my, I have uh, about 15% or I have 31% when you look at all my donations. So damn it, I'm not going to qualify for the priority periods. Don't worry. Uh, there, is, there are two things that, that protect you here. 20% uh, of the fund, that's $3 billion will still remain after the priority periods. Those priority periods can't eat up the entire fund. And also, uh, we're not sure how the SBA is going to prioritize this, uh, but we're hoping that there will be a, a, a restart on the ticker and there will be a fresh 2 billion component of this for small entities. Uh, that is entities with less than 50 full-time employees. I think I've summed up the priority periods. There may be questions about this we can come back to because the priority periods are complicated, but they are important because we need to get this help out to, to these entities that are really like any day now, they're gonna, they're gonna have the collection agents coming in and closing them down. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the initial grants, allowable expenses are sort of what you would expect. Um, I don't want to get too into the specifics on allowable expenses, but uh, I do want to say that you should read them. Every organization is different. Some of you own your building, some of you pay rent, some of you lease your spaces, some of you have ex extensive uh, capital expenses and maintaining your properties, others don't. So I want you to just all sort of on your own read what is allowable and ask if it pertains to you. If, if these allowable expenses don't fit your entity, you might want to look at other sources of relief such as the PPP and certainly the, the employee retention tax credit. Um, there are time periods that make sense that are associated with the SVOG. Uh, and there's a, there are further time periods that are laid out very clearly in the act that are aimed at how people, if they're continuing to hurt and they're continuing to be shut down by April, they can qualify for a supplemental grant through the SVO, and then there are allowable expenses that extend out uh, further into the calendar from that, way into, into as far out as twenty as, as that twenty twenty two. But uh, again, let's let's go on to the next slide. The, some of the allowable expenses stuff is common sense. You can't uh, pay any uh, person a salary of more than a hundred thousand dollars. You cannot buy a yacht. You can't buy new property. Uh, those types of common sense things. This is not meant to enrich anybody to the point of, oh, we'll build a new building with this. No, this is about survival. Uh, next slide. So there will be uh, one a self-certified uh, statement that you'll need to make that says that because of current economic conditions, uh, this grant is a lifesaver and is absolutely necessary for you to go on. This is, uh, this is here because they're going to look at, uh, at all of us, all entities that apply, and they're going to scrutinize. They're going to say, does this entity really need this to survive? Or is this just going to help make them whole? And they're focusing on the former. This is about survival. This is life support. This is not about making anybody whole or bringing them up to where they were in 2019. It's really, you're going to have to certify that uh, without this, you're, you're not going to be able to continue. Um, again, I'm going to mention that you cannot apply for a PPP and an SBO grant. So choose very carefully, read about both programs. For many of you, it could be that the PPP actually gets you further along and is a more attainable and more immediate thing. And the PPP for those reasons and others may be better for you, um, but it could be that the SBO is better for you, in, in which case you should be very careful, read all the rules uh, when they come out. We, we're expecting the rules anytime, they could come out soon, uh, but again, it could be a couple of weeks before we get the rules. Um, but be, be very careful. You cannot do, you cannot do both. Uh, accrual accounting should be used to determine revenue. If those words freak you out, 
you know, especially if you're a little guy uh, or a small mom and pop operation or a, a new nonprofit and you don't know the difference between cash accounting and accrual accounting, that's okay. We have resources for you uh, that I can link you to. The SBA has uh, regional offices, the SBDC, uh, the Small Business Development uh, offices are there, are there to help you. There are women's business centers that are standing by that are ready to help you understand how to better do your books to qualify, not just for this program, for, but for any program. Uh, there are veterans groups. And then when I first started my company, uh, we were a very small venue and I used something called SCORE, which is a retired executives. And I had a lovely old guy who was in his seventies who helped us start out and get our books in order. And we wouldn't be alive if we hadn't done that 18 years ago, 19 years ago. I encourage you all to take use, uh, use these resources that the SBA is offering. Um, I don't want to talk about affiliation. Yeah, I think we can skip to this. I'm probably going a little long. Let's go to the next one. This is a complicated uh, grant program. Um, here are some things that we highly recommend that you do uh, to get ready to uh, determine whether you're going to apply for this or not. Have your financials out. Uh, for some reason, they mentioned in the, in the FAQs that they may want to see your financials by month. We're not sure exactly why they said that, but have them ready by month. You never know. The SBA may ask for that and they may have a good reason for that. Uh, make sure your tax returns are at your fingertips. Uh, make sure your DUNS number is out. If, and again, if that DUNS number language, uh, if you're a small company or a, a new nonprofit and you don't know what a DUNS number is, don't worry. You're not, you're not out of this. You, can still, you still have time to do it. Uh, active SAMS account. And when you activate your SAMS account, Push it all the way through until you get your cage number, because we're told that the cage number is very important uh, as part of this. Um, and also make sure you register for, for your account at grants.gov. Uh, for, you, for you seasoned nonprofits, none of these, none of these things are going to um, cause your hair to stand on end. But for again, if they do, there are many resources available to you. Um, and some of them are in this slide. Uh, another thing we ask uh, you you to be aware of is that the FAQs ask you to have a floor plan ready. Um, there may be other things that you need to have ready. This is not an exhaustive list. Uh, I, would, I would keep your contracts handy. They've hinted that contracts and other evidence of the, that you put on shows regularly that are available to the public are going to be necessary. Uh, and, if, and again, I mentioned these earlier, but here's a list of them. Um, the SBDCs, the, develop, the Small Business Development Centers, are very helpful. And also, I should add, they're underutilized. They'll be happy to hear from you. They're probably getting a lot of traffic right now, but still, uh, in, in general, you can get through to somebody same day or within 24 hours who can help you pull your books together. Uh, and the uh, local SCORE offices and women's business centers and veterans business centers are excellent resources. I still refer people to them every day and everybody says, oh my God, they helped me get my books together. I totally understand why the difference between accrual accounting and cash accounting makes a difference. And, it's just really helpful. And they can sometimes they can help with the SAMS and DUNS stuff as well. Although SAMS has a good hotline and so does DUNS. And I can put those in the link as well, or in the chat as well. Next slide, please. No, oh, that's it. So we're, we're at Q&A now. Okay. And I, I hope I didn't go too fast or too slow there. I wasn't watching things. Uh, Jim and Kit. Jim and Karen and Larry, this has been uh, this has been hugely hugely uh, beneficial. Thank you for sharing the knowledge. And now we'll just spend a little bit of time, kind of <clears throat> going over some of the questions that we've received. Again, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and sharing this information with us. Okay, so here's some general questions. What's the most important actions someone can today can do today while uh, gathering their information and preparing for these opportunities? Anyone this is my mic still. My mic is still hot, so I'll say. <laughs> as far as uh, as far as the SVO grant goes, make sure that your ducks are in a row with SAMS, DUNS, Grants.gov, and your internal house. Make sure that your house is in order. That you've got your uh, books ready to show, uh, and get your floor plan and and contracts out, and any other paperwork. Just know where it is. We've been shuttered for a year. You've got some dust on those filing cabinets. Uh, you, you don't know where that file is on your on your laptop or whatever. Find it. Be ready because you don't want to be uh, having that added wrinkle of stress of not knowing where things are. And even, I say that even to big organizations because you may have laid off your internal staff who normally has those things for you at your fingertip. Uh, and if you're a little uh, entity, you may have it in a 
you may have it on a hard drive somewhere that you forgot that you put it there. Find your stuff, be ready. Yeah, that's great. Uh, following up on that, how long does it take to get the login.gov and SAM accounts approved once uh, someone has signed up for them? Yeah, so a lot of our, our members just have gone through this process and I've been monitoring it. Uh, the good news is that there is time. Uh, the bad news is that it, it is a daunting process. If you're not, if you don't know where your DUNS number is, or if there's some sort of a conflict, maybe you've got a business partner who did the registering for the DUNS, but then they've since moved on and they're working somewhere else, and it's maybe their email that's connected with it. It can take a few steps to get through the process of making sure you've got your proper DUNS number in the right place. Uh, but it, it hasn't taken anybody more than seven business days yet. I've been, I've got a list of all of my, a bunch of members that are all going through the SAMs and the DUNS and the grants.gov. And the longest step is uh, seven days. Uh, and I think it's a SAMs uh, getting the notarized. There's a component of registering your SAMs account that asks you to uh, notarize a letter. Uh, and then you send that into them. Uh, and it says up to 30 days on, on the website, but it's been happening quicker than that, which is kind of amazing considering how many organizations are coming at them right now. So the, usually it's a next day thing for getting your number, registering, registering through grants.gov is almost instamatic uh, or almost instant. But with the SAMs and DUNS, there are a few steps that you might have to take that take a day or two. And at worst, we're finding it's a week out for, for most of the steps, but get on it now. Don't hesitate to do those things. Those are boring bureaucratic exercises, but they have to be done. Absolutely, they do have to be done. Thank you. Um, next question. Is it possible to revoke an application and switch which program you would like to go after? What, if anything, can people do now to shift from PPP if they don't get an SVO grant? Maybe I'll take that and Jim, you can interject is you know, I think the way the law was written, it was written to say you cannot have received a PPP loan to be able to go in under the SBO program, but the SBA changed that to say you can't even apply for a PPP loan. So if you have already gone in and applied for a PPP loan, I believe, you know, that deems you to be ineligible, even if that was submitted through the portal. I have a number of clients, Jim, that they're sitting and just waiting to see if we get more information on the SBO grant before their bank actually releases the application under the PPP program. So I yeah, the time the timing is already submitted. Yes, the timing is really unfortunate. It's it's but it's not. It's certainly not intentionally so. The SBA has this huge job of uh, putting together a new program that's very complicated, and that's the SBO program. Uh, and it was relatively straight, relatively straightforward for them to uh, re-engage the PPP, PPP2, as everybody's calling it. Uh, so they were able to do that first. The unfortunate thing is that everybody has to, everybody who's considering both programs has to wait and see. How easy is it to revoke? We're told it's extremely difficult. We haven't gotten any good news stories from entities who have applied. Once your application is received, uh, I haven't heard of, I've only heard of about a half a dozen of those across the country. Um, people who are trying to retract their, uh, their uh, PPP. Um, if it's still, still sitting on your banker's desk because the PPP goes through a lending institution, you may be able to, but once it's received by the SBA, uh, the news so far is bad. And the, re the justification for that is that when you apply, and you're not gonna wanna hear this if you're one of these entities, but when you apply for the PPP, you check the box saying you weren't going to receive an SVO grant. Uh, and because the SBA put that that safeguard in there for themselves, they feel justified, uh, and I can't blame them for for saying no to retracting and then and, and letting people choose their choose their program. Gotcha. Thank you. Hey, we're getting a lot of questions about whether venues affiliated with colleges or and universities are eligible. Can you guys speak about this? Um, yeah, I can, and it has to do with how the rules come out. Uh, regarding affiliates and affiliation. There's all sorts of rules about that and there, and how the how the uh, federal funding, whether your college is a federally funded institution uh, and what the affiliation rules that we're going to hear any time now from the SBA will, will say. Um, I know that APAP is doing a lot of really good work on this. Uh, APAP, I'm sorry, can't, I can't remember what those letters stand for, uh, but we've been, work, we've been working with them and with other interested uh, stakeholders in this uh, SBO grant. And I think uh, colleges and educational institutions should reach out to APAP about that. If I have if I have the letters right, I, I could be wrong about that. But 
uh, they have much better specifics about what they've been doing in terms of advocacy and in terms of uh, watching the rulemaking process as it pertains to colleges. Gotcha. Here's another question. If you do not see your organization represented in the examples laid out so far, what would you suggest doing next? I would suggest going to your trade organization. And if you're not a member of a trade organization, uh, get out there and, and form one, uh, because it could be that you don't qualify for this. It could be, and, and you, but there will be more help coming. Uh, a lot of people spend time, uh, different industries spend time trying to shoehorn themselves into relief programs uh, when it's very possible that that time could be better spent writing letters to representatives to try to get aid for their relief program. I realize that, uh, that the entertainment industry and performing arts institutions have done well in convincing our elected to uh, bring relief program. And we are very appreciative of that. And we're very appreciative of the support from the public that we've had in getting there. Now we know that there are other affected industries um, that need help and we, we want, we will help them as they move forward in receiving uh, relief. Uh, but if I can't, since I don't know the, the specifics, Tori, I can't really, I can't really say, but hopefully there's some trade organization. And if there isn't a trade organization for your industry, form one now. We all came into being nine or 10 months ago. We just started this uh, process. There was no NEVA 10 months ago. It was formed in response to this pandemic. It's not too late. The pandemic, we have another year or so of suffering ahead of us. It's time to get together and act in solidarity with others who understand what you do and, and, and related industries who, who are part of your ecosystem. Great, 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 great. Thank you for that. Um, here's a question. How should a touring theater producer apply for an SVO grant with venues that don't have a ticketing system because they are schools? Any thoughts about that? It's a really good question. Um, that, 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 is, that is something that I'd have to really dive into the act and see how it applies. I would say they're a promoter and they can apply as a promoter since they don't have a brick and mortar. They're not a, uh, a physical venue. Uh, the question is if, if they're doing events that aren't ticketed, but they're rather free in schools, I, I'd really have to dig into the act. I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for that one, but okay. I hope they find relief. Um, here's another good question. A couple of questions that have come around the ERC. Is my nonprofit eligible for the ERC for wages in a quarter of 2020 where we received our state cares act funding and how does the erc work if a, if a shutdown is lifted part way through a quarter you know the shutdown question i'll answer first because when you're subject to a, a government shutdown you're eligible for the erc only for the period of the shutdown so you would actually you know it becomes almost like a covered period where you know, for whenever the, the, the shutdown period is, you all those qualified wages, you'd remove what you use for PPP loan forgiveness and the rest would qualify for the ERC. Uh, in terms of wages where um, there's a state CARES Act funding, you know, I'm not aware of any uh, limitations on that, that uh, the CARES Act funding um, and all these things are, are kind of relative, right? So the, the other thing that I would point out is that the ERC is, an IRS form that you can amend any time. So there, you know, these other grants that have specific periods and priority periods and the PPP is through March 31st, I would be looking at those first because you can always go back and get the ERC based on amending your 941 uh, if you're eligible. Okay, great. Here's another question that's just come in. Um, uh, when calculating for PPP, do they do folks include do folks include CARES funding that they received? You actually do, Tori. It's a great question. Is for calculating the reduction in your gross receipts, you need to take into account your receipts from all sources. So other types of CARES Act funding would be included in that quarter as you're making the comparison of the quarter 2020 to quarter 2019. Now, if you received Forgiveness on your PPP loan, that is not included in the gross receipts computation, but other CARES Act funding would be included. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, a couple of more questions have come in. Uh, when we're talking about years, for example, 2019, uh, are we talking about calendar years or fiscal years? Um, 
Would so folks want some clarity around that? For that purpose, we are talking calendar years. So when you're talking your PPP loans, your employee retention credit information that's going in for the shuttered venue, it's our understanding that all of those are requiring a calendar year computation. Gotcha. And then another uh, stream of questions around this, uh, this topic. Uh, do we have any idea how long the second round of the PPP will be available? I mean, the fact of the matter is that grants are limited to $2 million per organization. And that I think the last thing I read that there was maybe a hundred billion dollars that had just been used within the program. So there are still funds available. As much as we call this PPP2, I say it's PPP3. We had our first round of PPP in April that ran out right away, if we remember. Then we had the extension of PPP through the end of 2020. And those funds were never fully utilized. So those funds, or I should say ran through August where we had to go in and apply by, but those funds were never fully utilized. And it's really a, a slower use of that tranche of funds that we're seeing now for into 2021. We don't know if they'll run out before March, but again, there's still money out there. Well, thank you, Karen. Uh, another question has come in. Um, can you talk a little bit about, again, about the difference between the ERC and the, uh, the, uh, the, the, Shuttered Stages program, does the, does the ERC come out of the same organization or is it administered or is it, or is it administered by a different group? You know, the ERC is something that is actually an IRS form. So there isn't, there isn't any administration other than applying for it and calculating it. I'm not exactly sure how that's gonna to relate to the Shuttered Venue Operator Grant, but my impression is, is that you can get both. Although we haven't seen any uh, specific, you know, a, a, until we get the, the, the program details on the grant, um, I, I don't think we'll know, but you know, you talked about what can you do now? I think what you can do is evaluate all your grant opportunities today as you best understand them and then review them with someone who you consider to be an expert and, and kind of validate what you've got so you can know what direction to head. Thank you very much, Larry. Well, folks, it looks like that's about uh, the end of our time here. Thank you so much for joining us, Larry, Jim, and Karen. Thank you for providing this great information. And uh, as our folks mentioned, um, follow-up materials will be available, resource guides will be available, and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Tori. Thank we you. do have some other information that's on this slide talking about resources. You know, CLA as a firm, we have a live stream every Thursday each week that's, you know, really is sharing the latest information that's available on um, COVID relief opportunities. We have a resource hub. If you'd like to visit our website on the final slide, there's um, email addresses for all of us that were available to take email questions to assist organizations. And then Arts Midwest will be sending out a resource packet to everybody that signed up for today's webcast. So I believe we're right at the top of the hour. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending our webcast. Jim, for the great information on the SBO grants. It's nice to hear what those that are so deep with NEVA are hearing about the program also. And Larry, your insight as it relates to the employee retention credit and especially Arts Midwest for hosting this valuable insight. I think we called it um, the latest take one because we know there's going to be more information coming down the pike. So with that, thank you all.